solids. So the other two lessons in this chapter, we've kind of focused on liquids. So now we want to talk about solids for just a minute. Uh, we'll talk about solid structures in two main categories here. Uh, and then we'll talk about the various types of solids and how the structures uh, they adopt relate to their physical properties. This lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist. And if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. So to start our discussion of solids here, we're going to talk about uh, the two major categories of solid structures, amorphous and crystalline. An amorphous structure is something like glass. That's the most notable example. And uh, if you look at glass at kind of the uh, molecular or atomic level, so you'll find that it has no ordered structure whatsoever. The, the placement of all the different atoms is just random. So it is frozen in that kind of a state. And so glass is the most notable example, but it's also present in certain plastics. Uh, crystalline is much more common, and so in a crystalline structure, you have a nice highly ordered structure. It's usually in a nice regular and repeating pattern where, uh, you know, the locations of all the ions or molecules or atoms is in a nice predictable regular repeating pattern. And so, uh, if you look, one of the more common examples of crystalline substances, if you look down on your study guide there, are the what we call cubic unit cells or cubic lattices, where you kind of have everything adopting kind of a cube shape. And so if you look at the most basic regular repeating pattern, it actually takes the shape of a cube. And what you'll find is that all the cubic lattices are going to have atoms at the eight corners of a cube. And so for a simple cubic or a primitive cubic, that's it. That's just where the eight corners are. And you just repeat this out three dimensionally in all directions and, you know, kind of have uh, just replicate all these exact positions in a regular repeating fashion. So if you look at what's called a body-centered cubic, you'd put one more atom right in the center of this cube. So cubics always have these eight positions occupied at the corners of the cube. So, and for simple cubic, that's it. But for the body-centered cubic, one additional atom at the center of the cube. And then there's also something called face-centered cubic, which in addition to these eight corner positions, would then have a, an atom at the center of each of the six faces of the cube. Cool. And these cubic unit cells, you don't need to know them. I just wanted to show you some examples. I put them up uh, in your study guide there. I'll put some up on the screen here. I just wanted you to see these kind of regular repeating uh, patterns that are typical of a crystalline substance, just so that you've seen them. But you're not going to get tested on these. I'm not going to quiz you on these. You're not responsible for them at this stage of the game. It is something we might cover in a little more advanced class, like in college or even the AP. Um, but for standard high school, not something you're on the hook for. I just want to make sure you're familiar with what a crystalline substance actually looked like. All right, so now we just want to briefly look at the four different types of solids, ionic, molecular, network, covalent, and metallic. We've looked at these before back in our lesson on bonding and, and we are identifying different types of substances. And specifically, we want to talk about these different types of solids. We'll relate some of those characteristics back. And, but we want to identify those. Are these typically amorphous? Are they typically crystalline? What's holding these structures together? Things of this sort. So if we start with ionic here, so these tend to be crystalline almost exclusively. So, and they're held together by ionic bonds, which are rather strong. And uh, in this case, being rather strong, these tend to have fairly high melting points and boiling points. Uh, and again, you guys learned back in the day that ionic uh, solids tend to be brittle. So because you got these layers of plus and minus ions and where every positive ion is surrounded by negative ions and every negative by positives. But if you put a stress on it, like hit it with a hammer, you might shift the layers. Now, all of a sudden, you might have positive ions next to positive and negative next to negative, and those layers might separate. So and that's what makes ionic compounds brittle. So something we covered, again, a couple chapters ago. So, but crystalline lattice held together by ionic bonds. And you might recall that uh, the smaller the ions and the greater their charges, so the stronger the ionic bonds and then the higher the melting points. All right, molecular compounds. So it turns out molecular compounds might either be amorphous or crystalline. Now, the most common examples you're likely to see are going to be crystalline. So like things like, you know, ice is typically going to adopt a crystalline structure. And it turns out it's not just one crystalline structure. So depending on how rapidly you cool the water and stuff like this, uh, might determine what crystalline structure adopts. But the common one that you're likely to encounter in everyday life is a, you know, standard crystalline structure. So, but you might have some molecular compounds adopting amorphous structures as well. So, uh, Certain plastics, we mentioned those, uh, are technically molecular compounds typically and uh, can be amorphous in structure. Not all plastics, but certain ones. 
Uh, you'll also find that a lot of your macromolecules uh, in biology, so things like uh, DNA and proteins and things of the sort, are often going to be amorphous most of the time. So it turns out it's, it's to our advantage if we can actually turn them into crystals. So because if we can turn them into a, a nice regular repeating uh, pattern of a crystal, we actually can elucidate their structure at the atomic or molecular level to a much greater degree. And so uh, there's a whole science and an art, you might even say, at trying to get some of these big macromolecules to adopt crystals because most of the time they adopt an amorphous structure instead. So your molecular compounds are held together by intermolecular forces, which we studied early, uh, earlier in this lesson. Let's see if I can spell this correctly. So, and these intermolecular forces, again, way weaker than ionic bonds. And so because these are held together by much weaker forces, these tend to have much lower melting points and boiling points than ionic compounds. So these also tend to be much softer substances as well. And when, especially when we compare them to the network covalent compounds in just a second. All right, so these network covalent compounds, there are not a lot of examples of these, sometimes uh, more probably called network covalent solids. So not a lot of examples of these, and the most notable ones you need to know are diamond, which is pure carbon. So, and then also silicon dioxide in the form of quartz. Cool, and these are your most notable examples, again, these network covalent solids, and these are crystalline for sure. Nice regular repeating patterns in a crystal. Uh, and in this case, what actually holds these together, it's not ionic bonds, it's not intermolecular forces. So in here, like in diamond, all the carbon atoms are covalently bonded together. Or here, the silicon and oxygen atoms are covalently bonded together. So it's actually covalent bonds holding this together uh, rather than ionic bonds or intermolecular forces. And these are some of the strongest forces that would hold any kind of crystalline substance together. And as a result, these network covalent so solids tend to have very high melting points and boiling points. And often, again, take a look at diamond in particular, some of the hardest substances. So back here, when we said that molecular compounds tend to be on the softer side, we're kind of comparing with these network covalent solids especially, which are definitely hard. So diamond, again, one of the hardest substances we know of. All right, finally, we'll talk about metallic substances. And uh, in this case, these tend to definitely be crystalline. So, and what's holding them together, uh, we'll call metallic bonds. And we talked about metallic bonding briefly a couple chapters ago, but very briefly. So, and the big thing is what, what kind of properties you want to associate with this with. And so we've kind of talked about where these fall in terms of melting points. Well, for metals, they're all over the place. They're a huge range of different melting points. Yeah, you might have something like cesium, which will melt in your hand, or mercury, which is already liquid at room temp, uh, all the way to something like tungsten, which has a, a melting point of over 3000 degrees Celsius. So huge range of melting points possible. So we can't like, peg it and just say they're higher or they're lower, they're all over the place. Uh, but some of those metallic products you're definitely on the hook for, we studied a couple chapters ago, and uh, you got to know that they have a characteristic luster associated with them, so they're shiny. So you got to know that they conduct electricity and heat very well, so good conductors. You've got to know, um, uh, in addition to luster, that they are both malleable and ductile. Malleable means you can pound them into sheets, you can change their shapes. Uh, ductile means you can draw them and form wires out of them. We say draw them into wires. So all those words we kind of associated with metals a couple chapters ago, still relevant in this chapter as well. So you could put it either place, I just decided to put it in both. Um, but cool. So these are kind of your four basic type substances. Know whether they're crystalline or amorphous or both. Uh, and then definitely know some of the key characteristics of each. Cool, that wraps up this chapter. If you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the more helpful things you can do to help support the channel. If you are looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice quizzes and chapter tests, things of a sort, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.